I first heard about invasive Asian carp and the damage that they can do to freshwater ecosystems, this was the water that I thought about. Grand Traverse Bay, Lake Michigan, right where I grew up. I worried about what they would do to the freshwater economy that we have based on tourism. But this isn't the only area that could be impacted by Asian carp. There's places all over the country that are already being impacted by invasive Asian carp. And so we're gonna take a trip from here in Northern Michigan all the way down to Tennessee to talk to people whose businesses could be impacted, people who are already being impacted, and the agency personnel and the scientists and the NGOs working on stopping Asian carp and recovering our waters. I'm a G-Jack and Dota, Maganaxing Odawa Nada, Doug Craven and Digitacas. Uh, my name is Doug Craven. I'm the Natural Resources Department Director for Little Traverse Bay Bands Odawa Indians. Uh, we're here on the shore of Little Traverse Bay at the John W. Kishik boat launch. Uh, this is a launch used by our commercial and subsistence fishermen. LTBB uh, community is a coastal community. We've been here on the uh, Great Lakes in this part of the, the world for millennia. So the Great Lakes itself uh, the health of the Great Lakes, the health of Lake Michigan, uh, the health of the fishery are very important to the Little Traverse Bay Bands. Obviously, the lakes are imperiled right now. Uh, there's a lot of stressors on the Great Lakes. Uh, quagga mussels, zebra mussels are the predominant ones right now, gobies, a number of other species. So we're really concerned about the potential for Asian carp uh, getting into the system and adding one more stressor uh, to an already fragile uh, environment. As a scientist, a tournament angler, and a U.S. Coast Guard licensed charter captain, um, I feel that's given me uh, a unique perspective on the threat of Asian carp to the Great Lakes. Uh, some of the research has shown that they are able to survive in the Great Lakes uh, once they're introduced, if they're introduced into the waters of Lake Michigan. Um, the rivers along the Great Lakes, there are several that have the correct parameters that allow uh, spawning success. Some of the projects that I've, that I've worked on have shown that um, they could have negative impacts on food webs in places such as Lake Erie, Saginaw Bay, um, Green Bay. Um, by uh, outcompeting uh, some of the native planktivores, alewife, gizzard shad, bloaters, for, for example, which would then have uh, in a cascading effect across, across multiple trophic levels of the food web. If that were to occur, of course, there would be uh, serious economic impacts uh, along the shores of the Great Lakes. Um, which would not just affect the value of a $7 billion a year fishery, but would also affect things such as property values, uh, other tourism dollars. It's an imminent threat. It's a, a threat to the livelihood of the Great Lakes, the health of the Great Lakes, and I feel that it's something that um, all citizens should come together to fight. Michigan's $26.6 billion outdoor recreation industry includes many water-based businesses. We joined Sleeping Bear Surf and Kayak for some surfing lessons and to learn how Asian carp could impact outdoor recreation in the Great Lakes. My name is Ellis Grocki. I'm one of the daughters of the owners of Sleeping Bear Surf and Kayak. We're a surf shop that also provides rentals, lessons, and camps based in Empire, Michigan. We get an influx of tourists from out of state, um, as well as a strong community here in northern Michigan. Um, that comes up to enjoy the diverse ecosystem that we have in the Great Lakes region and specifically here in the Sleeping Bear Dunes, um, which was the inspiration behind our shop. And if we had an influx of Asian carp, it would most definitely prohibit that influx of tourists and make it a, a bit unattractive for people to get in the water to paddle and surf and swim and enjoy the, the shark free waters that we call home. Wow, what a fun morning of surfing here in Frankfurt. And it's water sports like this, as well as kayaking, fishing, um, that bring people up to this area and support businesses like Sleeping Bear Surf and Kayak. But you can imagine as hard as it was for me to get up as a beginner, imagine how much harder that would be with Asian carp jumping around. But it's not just the businesses like this that rent out water sports equipment that are supported by people coming up here that could be impacted by Asian carp. Once they get done here, they also go out, go out to eat, go out and have a cocktail. And so next we're going to head up to Mammoth Distilling and we're going to see the way that one of those businesses operates, how that would be impacted, as well as how many people are employed and how that product is actually made here in northern Michigan. Mammoth is a full service distillery. We make everything from rum to gin, vodka and three or four kinds of whiskeys, in addition to beer and wine on the side. We have a number of locations around northern Michigan, all of them 
heavily influenced by the tourism industry. In fact, we rely entirely on it. Uh, Central Lake is our home, a town of 800 people only. Couldn't survive here uh, in any way without tourism. And this is, uh, Bel Air is 1,200 people, so very, very heavily reliant on people visiting us, experiencing our brand uh, while they're on vacation and taking that home with them. Every one of our locations is located on the water directly, so the water is a critically important part of the area and all that we do and support, and it drives our business. The water and the life within it also impact the Great Lakes $7 billion sport fishery. This doesn't just include the Great Lakes, but also connected inland waters, like the Grand River in Michigan, where we join Tom Workman of Workman Outfitters for some bass and pike fishing, as well as to understand how Asian carp could impact his business. So Max and I started this business uh, back in 2016. Um, he had just graduated from high school and wanted to be a fishing guide. And so we chose the Grand River, one, because it's, it runs through a major metropolitan area. And we thought from a business standpoint that we could attract people who come to Grand Rapids to come and fish on it. The most popular fish species during the summer are gonna be your smallmouth bass and northern pike. Um, there are um, some largemouth bass in this section. Um, we have started to catch muskie up here. Um, we're starting to find those. You get your steelhead runs through here. You get your salmon runs through here. Uh, walleye are up here. We catch those as well too. And everything from your panfish to um, gar pike. It's a very diverse fishery up here and that's what makes it so healthy is that you've got that diversity here. You've got that biomass. You've got um, everything from crayfish right on through to you know creek chubs that are floating through here that just that these fish these game species feed on. There we go. Got one. <laughs> Oh, it's a pike. Little guy. Little pike. You know, I, I gotta say, it, what's starting to keep me up a little bit more at night now is the Asian carp. Um, if that were to get into this river system, it would decimate the biodiversity that's here. Much like a, much like a dredge homogenizes the river, you're gonna have the same thing with an Asian carp because they effectively just dredge everything. They root everything up, they eat everything from the plankton, which all those small species depend on for the larger species and just, you know, there's no predator that can keep them in check. It, it would be sad to lose something like this so close to a major metropolitan area. Asian carp have already invaded many river systems in Indiana. We joined Emily Wood of the Indiana Wildlife Federation near Fort Wayne at the site of a project already completed to block one potential pathway for Asian carp to get to the Great Lakes. Here in Indiana, a lot of people don't know, but Asian carp have actually infested many of, this, of our southern waterways all the way up to the central part of the state. So, you know, when they started to do studies in the Great Lakes Mississippi River Inner Basin study, they discovered that this point here in Fort Wayne at Eagle Marsh was the point where uh, it was the, the second most likely spot for Asian carp to make it uh, up to the Great Lakes after the Chicago area waterway system. And so um, this is a huge infrastructure project. Not only is it a beautiful restoration, uh, but it's actually serving a purpose of keeping the Wabash River, which is infested with Asian carp, from mixing with the waters of the St. Mary's River, which heads right up to Lake Erie. So this piece of, of land right here is keeping uh, Asian carp from making it in and devastating Lake Erie. Uh, what we see once Asian carp make it into a waterway is that they start to outcompete the things that we really like to see. So the reason that people come to Indiana to fish in our rivers because they like to see, you know, our largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, crappie, bluegill, all the different kinds of panfish. Uh, those things are becoming way less prevalent in our waterways because Asian carp are, are, are essentially eating the food out from underneath them. We followed the Wabash River west from Fort Wayne to where it meets the Tippecanoe River near Lafayette. We joined Dave Hosler, owner of Pilecast Fly Fishing, and Don Cranfill of Sportsman Magazine to experience firsthand how Asian carp are impacting fishing in Indiana. We were parked up there by that fish ladder, fishing for smallies, and uh, I smacked the paddle on the water right on the outside of that, and uh, three silver carp came up just like rockets, and I caught one right to the chest. just hit me and my feet, you know, because you're not expecting that and you're in a canoe, bottom of my feet just went out and I just straight up 
landed on my back and um, found out that uh, big silver carp to the chest really hurt. I think one of the toughest parts, like fishing up here, is you're supposed to, when you kill them, you know, you're not supposed to really throw them out. So there's no real good place to put them. So uh, you guys can smell it now. It's, it's usually worse. By August, it's uh, when it gets real hot, this place is disgustingly uh, aromic. We are uh, on the Tippecanoe River, but this is typical to most rivers in Indiana right now. The, uh, the White River is, is, is bad with these Asian carp. They've affected the fishing in uh, southern Indiana tremendously. Uh, came up here today to see how bad it was here with these folks, and uh, this is, it's just as bad as what I see on my home waters. Uh, these things have devastated the rivers and creeks, and they've uh, really, really affected the, the fishing. Uh, what scares me is that uh, these things are going to take over the rest of the, the reservoirs, and uh, then we'll be all of our recreational boating and fishing is going to change forever. Wow, so we just turned the motor on here, and these things are jumping all over. This one jumped in the boat. I had to jump out of the way, just about got drilled with it. And uh, yeah, so this is a silver carp. So, you know, I had to jump out of the way. I can imagine trying to fish with these things hopping all over the place, and we're just getting started. Further west, Asian carp have already invaded the Illinois River, which connects to Lake Michigan through the Chicago area waterway system. While there exists a series of electric barriers, in 2017, a silver carp was found on the wrong side of those barriers, the Lake Michigan side. We joined Robert Hirschfeld of the Prairie Rivers Network to find out what's being done about Asian carp in Illinois and what still needs to be done. We're here on the bank of the Illinois River in Peoria, Illinois. This river, like many of Illinois' rivers and streams, is infested with Asian carp. For far too long, the threat of carp was not taken seriously, and by the time it really was on the radar of decision makers, carp were everywhere in Illinois. There are a couple things being done about carp uh, in Illinois. They are harvesting them, they're pulling them out uh, by the millions of pounds, that is fine to address carp where they are. That's, that's an okay solution for that problem, but it's never gonna solve the problem of preventing carp from moving into new territory, including the Great Lakes. If we wanna stop carp from getting in the Great Lakes, we need serious barriers. Something like the Brandon Road Project, which is a suite of technologies that will be installed at the Brandon Road Lock and Dam in Joliet, Illinois. There's multiple technologies that would prevent carp from moving through that lock and dam and getting into Lake Michigan and through Lake Michigan, the rest of the Great Lakes. Brandon Road is a great first step. We've got to do something. Um, more is needed after Brandon though. Not only do we need to do more to prevent carp from getting in the Great Lakes to bring that risk level of risk down to zero, but we also need to take action to prevent other invasive species that are currently in the Great Lakes from moving through the Chicago waterway system and coming into the Illinois River. One thing Brandon Road can't do is prevent the two-way transfer of invasive species. So even after Brandon Road gets built, we're going to need to take steps to prevent invasive species from invading Illinois' rivers. Further south in Tennessee, Asian carp are affecting the fishing and also the hunting. We joined my colleague Bill Cooksey of Vanishing Paradise and Mike Butler, CEO of the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, to show us the impact that Asian carp are having on Tennessee waters like Kentucky Lake and Camden Bottoms. We're in the Camden Bottoms WMA. It's a wildlife management area that's really known for duck hunting. It's a phenomenal uh, public hunting area, but it's also a great fishing spot. The carp, when you're running these these trails at 4 a.m. going duck hunting, um, I've been in places like this with ice on the water and you're breaking ice with your boat and suddenly carp are coming up through the ice and jumping into your boat, hitting you in the head. And if you think that's a rush in the daylight, you ought to try it at 4 a.m. There you go, Butler. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
look at that nasty thing. Here in a little bit, we're going to get out on the main lake. That's Kentucky Lake, and it's just you know a few hundred yards really uh, from us right now. But Kentucky Lake historically has been one of the top ten bass fishing destinations in the country forever. But we've had a perfect storm, and the carp have been a big part of that. And they're filter feeders, and they eat the same thing. Our shad, and all of our our forage fish, and even our game fish fry. Um, that's what they eat, and that's that's where they come from. So with these carp here, we've, we've lost a forage base. So with bass having bad spawns, nowhere to hide because we don't have grass, and now there's not a lot for them to eat, and, and it's killed our fishery. Well, they say these get to be about 110 pounds. How would you like a 110-pound fish like that in your boat? The model that we've worked with other fisheries professionals to develop is called block and tackle. You put barriers on the locks on all the dams on the Cumberland and Tennessee River, and then you use commercial fishermen to remove the fish. And that has proven to be an effective approach on the Illinois River, for example. The simple thing that we've been focused on is building a coalition of about seven different states, including their U.S. Senate offices and their U.S. Congressmen's offices, to focus with the federal agencies involved and all the state fisheries agencies involved to go find the resources financially, the money, to give our agencies who are tasked with managing the resource the ability to remove these fish and start to effectively lessen their numbers. We just went over a school of Asian carp, probably big heads, they're down deep, but they're really about from the bottom up to within about six feet of the surface. It's a loose school, they're big fish. Early on, we'd come over a spot like this and, and you start thinking, my God, look at all the bass. And then after a little while, you finally realize these aren't bass, you know, they're carp. Well, it's impacting recreation, recreational use. It's impacting lake home values. It's impacting all different types of things, including the health of the fishery. We've seen declines in crappie fishing success. We've seen the loss of different uh, fishing tournaments. Uh, we can verify losing three million dollars worth of economic impact from fishing tournaments this past year just on the reservoir we're sitting on right now. And so it's, it's a multi-pronged uh, multi impact that if we don't get aggressive with these fish now, we will lose the ability to manage them. They'll, they'll, be, they'll overtake us. So Asian carp are a national problem that requires a national solution. From the fisheries in northern Michigan all the way down to Kentucky Lake, from the lower stretches of the Mississippi River up through Tennessee and Illinois and as far north as Dakotas, Asian carp are a problem. And it's not a regional issue, it's national in scope. And as such, we have to address it that way. Because we know that if we can reduce the numbers of carp in southern waters, that ultimately reduces the pressure of carp potentially getting into Lake Michigan and the rest of the Great Lakes. Our strategy of nationalizing this is working to remove them from existing waters in the south, but also trying to prevent them from getting into the Great Lakes. And we feel we have a pretty good plan to do that. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has identified the Brandon Road Lock and Dam as a great choke point to stop Asian carp from getting into Lake Michigan. It is a series of technologies that will enhance the lock so that you can protect the resource, but also allow shipping and commerce to continue. This is important because we know that we need everyone at the table fighting to keep carp out because our $7 billion fishery here in the Great Lakes, our $15 billion boating industry are at stake. So we know that our efforts to keep carp out are paramount to keeping our quality of life and our economy here thriving. Not only for us now, but for our future generations. Asian carp impact and threaten a wide range of values across the country. From threatening fisheries and tourism in the Great Lakes, to harming fishing, hunting, and even property values in Tennessee. We have seen some progress, like the Eagle Marsh berm in Indiana, but even more is needed to stop Asian carp. We have too much to lose.